red May, your month-long vacation from capitalism surges onward into its seventh day and rather amazingly, its uh, fifth year. Before we get into our very timely discussion of uh, mutual aid, which uh, may or may not feature a tortoise too, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, fill you in on what's coming up in the next few days, uh, which of course you can find on our website, redmayseattle.org. Uh, uh, we have at 3 p.m. Uh, today, what we talk about when we talk about Marx. Uh, it's a conversation between Paul Maddock Jr., the editor of the Field Notes section in the Brooklyn Rail and uh, author of uh, 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 a number of wonderful books like Theory is Critique, uh, and Jason Smith. Uh, on Saturday at 11 a.m., coming from Berlin, we have Michael Heinrich, who will give a talk on the political impact of Marx's form analysis. Um, continuing onward, if my... Uh, uh, if my phone will uh, somehow get to it, we have a red deal with the humble people of the earth. That's 3 p.m. It uh, celebrates Red Media's first book. Uh, and then on uh, Sunday, we have uh, at 10 a.m., Workers' Autonomy from Detroit to Turin and Beyond. Uh, and uh, a Tuesday at 11 a.m., Class Power on Zero Hours, Strategies for the Current Moment, uh, by the Angry Workers Collective, so a lot of very interesting stuff. Uh, how do we how do we fund this? Well, I'm I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are no institute. There's no institutional funding for a festival. One of whose slogans is "Be a commie for a month." Uh, so we are like Blanche Dubois. We depend on the kindness of strangers. Uh, you can make that kindness manifest in two places. Uh, one is in our GoFundMe, Fan the Flames of Red May, and the other is on our website, www.redmayseattle.org, where there is a button called Donate, where you can become uh, a regular Patreon member. There are various options uh, that suit your budget. So please look in, and uh, now, without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the floor over uh, to uh, Chandan Reddy, associate professor at the University of Washington, but more important, a longtime friend of Red May, who has participated in multiple of our festivals and is, is remembered for his wonderful presentation uh, of Marx's On the Jewish Question. So Chandan, take it away. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was trying to find the uh, unmute button. Um, I want to thank Philip and everyone in Red May on behalf of everybody who's on the panel today for all the incredible work you're doing to create this um, intellectual community globally um, for such important conversations um, about Marxism today. Um, I also want to mention that Red May is, is also the month of Abolition May, which is a month of struggles all across Turtle Island to get cops off campus and cops off the planet. And I hope for folks who are tuning in that if you don't know about Abolition May, you'll also go to the copsoffcampuscoalition.com website um, and learn more about it. And if you are on a campus or live in a neighborhood in which a campus has been a poor neighbor to make sure to start your own chapter. Um, this event today brings together folks living and working across Turtle Island, and I want to acknowledge that and I want to express solidarity in particular with the Duwamish and Coast Salish people who've been stewards of the lands on which Red May is taking place. And as a guest here on these Duwamish lands, it's a privilege to be moderating this discussion with speakers well known, read and engaged by most folks who are tuning in. However, we'll also be putting folks' bios in the chat as well so that we can maximize our time for the crucial conversation we hope that we will have here with them and with you. Um, today's conversation, survival and resistance, mutual aid in disastrous times, could not be more timely, as India is now is experiencing among its mind-numbing numbers of infections, we're witnessing a state-created famine in oxygen that is creating a slow strangulation of folks to their deaths. 
So a discussion about mutual aid in the context of state abandonment and how we might build an alternative future seems to me particularly apposite um, for those of us who also come from the subcontinent. Um, I'm going to now introduce Dean Spade, who's going to give us a little overview of uh, today's event and how it's going to go, and then I will return um, to moderate a conversation with our distinguished guests. Thanks, Chandan. Thanks, Philip. Grateful to Red May, grateful to Barnard Center for Research on Women for putting on this event and making sure we have ASL interpretation. Um, and so grateful to Klee, Adrian, Naomi, and Chundin for being part of this conversation. I just wanted to contextualize how we got here. Um, Philip um, asked me if I would do an event about my book, Mutual Aid for Red May. And I realized that what would interest me the most would be um, a conversation about the question that I get asked most about the book, um, which I think the people on this panel have really different useful things to contribute to. So people keep asking me, what's the role of the state in producing and responding to crisis? And does an emphasis on mutual aid collaborate with neoliberal calls to dismantle social welfare programs and replace them with some kind of volunteerism and uh, you know, right-wing emphasis on church and family? And how do we relate to current calls to address mounting crises with state solutions like the Green New Deal and Medicare for All given some of the shortcomings of those proposals? And what role do tendencies toward autonomous, decentralized resistance formations and centralized formations have in this particular moment? Um, and for me, you know, I just was like, I'm gonna dream big and write to the three people who I most wanna have this <laughs> conversation with, and I'm sure it won't turn out. And then they all said yes. Um, each of these people has taught me things that deeply impact my thinking about how governments produce crises through relentless extraction, um, how governments exist to concentrate wealth and impoverish most people and to produce dependency on them and on various features of capitalism for everything we need. And they've also all taught me to think in deep ways and shown through their research how people are producing survival otherwise. Um, so I just, I like wanna be in the tangle of this conversation with these people very badly. Um, so I'm super grateful uh, that we get to be together. So I'll turn it back to Chundan to get us going. He's gonna ask each of us a question and then we're all gonna talk together and then we're gonna um, uh, take some questions from the YouTube chat. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, and I just want to reiterate Dean's profound appreciation to um, Klee, Adrian, and Naomi. It's, it, re it really is a, a dream to be in conversation with each of you um, uh, and to be moderating this panel. Um, so we thought we would begin by asking Klee um, uh, to be our first uh, respondent and speaker. Um, Klee, You've been immersed in mutual aid work responding to the severe COVID crisis among the Diné. What is being learned um, in this work? How have the events and the organizing of the last year, for example, including the uprising against police violence, the COVID pandemic, the election of Biden, and, un and the unrolling of his appointments and policies impacted Diné resistance? How has your experience of the past year maybe impacted how your work orients to the US government or to the broader question of governance that we're gonna be talking about? Yeah, Jay, um, I, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'll try to respond as meaningfully as possible. My name is Klee. I'm originally from Black Mesa on the Diné or Navajo Nation. Currently, I reside in so-called Flagstaff at the base of our holy mountain, the San Francisco Peaks. Um, I, uh, I'm not really sure to, where to begin with lessons that we've accumulated. Um, on one hand, it feels like many lifetimes have passed in just this last year alone. 
Um, and after all, as many people are very well aware that Dinepikea or the Navajo Nation has faced and endured the highest rate per capita of COVID-19 um, cases more than any settler colonial U.S. state. And so um, in response to that, I've, uh, in March of last year, I helped to start a group called Kinthana Mutual Aid. We also uh, started what became the Navajo Hopi COVID-19 Family Relief Fund. Uh, and we also formed, uh, immediately formed an indigenous mutual aid network that comprised a range of indigenous uh, organized, primarily autonomous organizations from throughout what we call Turtle Island. Um, I can share some practical elements I think perhaps would be useful for this conversation. Uh, and um, again, there's a, a lot to cover. Uh, perhaps I'll share some analysis that will help deepen your work as well, particularly from an anti-colonial position, which um, of course, Dean, that's where your book is a little deficient, but that's another story. Um, so we've learned a lot about how capitalism and infrastructure that the settler colonial project of the U.S. is based upon are extraordinarily vulnerable during this pandemic. We've also learned that mutual aid and mutual defense are necessary in the face of a multitude of crises. More than anything, we've learned how people have an extraordinary tendency towards generosity in the face of economic and social instability. We've worked to help others learn that colonial violence and violence against the earth has actually made our people more susceptible to viruses such as COVID-19. Uh, on the practical organizing level, we've learned that we have to establish clear agreements and boundaries regarding charity models of white savior and nonprofit missionaries uh, and directly challenge more fiercely their victimhood narratives and strategies that directly undermine our community's autonomy. Um, we've learned that we've had to be more clear that our cultures are our first framework for action. Uh, particularly, there's a great affinity with the anarchist principles of mutual aid, direct action, and voluntary cooperation, um, as, especially as mostly all other political proposals present uh, have unnecessary detours and distractions. Um, we've also had to expand our ideas and practices of security culture to include long-term uh, cultural practices of transformative and restorative justice, particularly as preventative measures to address cis-heteropatriarchal violence in organizing spaces. And that's a really key component, I think that's important on a practical organizational level that people need to understand. Um, more than anything, we've experienced that um, mutual aid is not just about redistributing resources, it's about radical redistribution of power to restore our life ways, to heal our communities and the land. Um, and you ask how this relates to how the, the, the Black Lives Matter uprising and the, uh, the events of last year with the Biden election and his appointments impact um, dinner resistance. But that's a huge question. Um, I actually wrote an article specifically addressing this uh, and it's posted on our website, indigenousaction.org. But I, I have to approach the question first from the position of Diné resistance, which is not a monolithic entity. Uh, and I'm definitely not the spokesperson for. Um, what I can speak to though, is that this isn't the first virus that our people have collectively faced. So we've looked to our traditional medicine practitioners. We've looked to our ceremonies, our medicines and our sacred sites for guidance. Um, you know, and the racist police state is unrelenting. We're operating in a new political environment with hyper-militarized police and extreme state surveillance. We see the response that was mounted at Standing Rock and the ways that the Black Lives Matter and anti-fascist movements have been heavily targeted. Um, and just as a, an example, and I, I'll, I'm trying to keep this short, um, more closer to home, a case that illustrates the severity of state surveillance here in Denebikea is one of a Diné young man's uh, case, and his name is Lauren Reed. Uh, he's a young Diné who was planning a George Floyd BLM solidarity demo in a very small town of Page, which is essentially a resource, you know, extractive based town. And the FBI infiltrated his private chat and charged him with threatening to burn down a police station. Um, he was held in pretrial detention since last July. Um, but the great news is that his lawyer recently negotiated a non-cooperating plea deal and reduced the charge to a misdemeanor. And he was facing a very serious federal charge 
Uh, so he just walked out of prison days ago, and this was just for a private Facebook chat. Uh, that was a joke. Um, you know, I think there's, it's also important to address in terms of the Biden administration that there's an inconvenient bit of liberal fantasy and fallacy. Um, I wrote a critique of voting is, um, ha is not harm reduction uh, that goes into detail. But the point I'll offer here is that whether it's the outright fascism of, or, of Trump or the neoliberalism of Biden, indigenous lands and lives will continue to be preyed upon by this economic system that is fueled by ongoing resource colonialism of our sacred lands and waters. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important to note that Biden's appointment of Deb Holland which uh, has been widely celebrated in um, Native America or indigenous communities. Um, you know, this may be seen as an overture to reconcile America's genocidal past, but those of us on the front line of these struggles see through this facade. She really exemplifies the way that indigeneity can be assimilated to maintain settler colonial order. You know, just around the Navajo Nation, we have 523 abandoned uranium mines. Um, 22 wells have been closed due to high levels of radioactive pollution. You know, our, our lands have faced uh, the single largest nuclear accident in US history. And the contamination from that accident is still poisoning the drinking water in our communities. Um, the, the statistics during the pandemic, which a lot of people paid attention to, were that 33% of those of us who live on the reservation don't have access to running water or electricity yet our lands are heavily exploited for coal, oil, and gas. So regardless of what administration has been in office, we've, we've had to fight constantly to protect our land, air, bodies, and waters. And this is important to connect because indigenous existence is deeply connected to the well-being of our sacred lands. Uh, in the midst of this pandemic and climate crisis, we need to protect these sacred places, which are critical sources for our healing ceremonies and our medicines, um, and in some instances, these sites are necessary to maintain balance in our cosmology. So from an anti-colonial and abolitionist standpoint, liberal strategies have only obscured the violences that this dominant social order represents. Uh, where, wherever there's an environmental crisis, there's a cultural crisis because we are people of the earth. And the reality is, is that colonial violence and violence against the earth has made our people more susceptible to viruses such as COVID-19. Um, and, and the last part of the question, I don't know, if, do I have time to get into it just shortly? Okay. Um, it's about governance and how that's impacted, um, uh, you know, our work and indigenous resistance in, in this area. Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it's actually right at the beginning stages of the pandemic, I think in February or so, um, indigenousaction.org published a piece um, that asked this simple question, why can we imagine the ending of the world, yet not the ending of colonialism? You know, our people have been refusing domination, control, and exploitation in these lands by colonial forces since 1492. Um, I don't think we need a history lesson here today, but what is important to share is that our prophecies warned of the consequences for violating Mother Earth. Our ways of being have guided us through the endings of worlds before. We need to listen now more than ever to our ancestors, the land, and our medicine carriers. In these times, we care for each other more fiercely than other because we are living in a time of prophecy and that is what we have been instructed to do you know the systems that precipitated this disharmony will certainly not lead us out of it we have to be clear about that uh, they will only craft new chains and new cages and new technologies to kill our people as the sickness ravages our lands we have to ask ourselves Will we continue to allow this empire to recuperate? And what can we do to make sure it doesn't? An anti-colonial and anti-capitalist world already exists. Um, and, and my father, who's a Dine Hatathli or medicine practitioner, has stated that there aren't two worlds. There are one world. There's just one world crossed by many paths. And if the path of greed, domination, exploitation, and competition doesn't accept that it's reached its dead end, then it's up to us to make sure of it. And, and so we can look at global warming. It's the greatest crisis facing humanity. But we have to understand that global warming is a direct consequence of the war against Mother Earth. 
and that to fully stop these mines, these power plants, these dams, these pipelines, we also have to stop the political machinery and systems that generate them. And so the powerful expression of mutual aid is an expression of ungovernability. And so we must also explore how we can make it impossible for this colonial system to govern on stolen occupied land. Yeah. Thank you so much, Clay, for that detailed response. Um, I wanted to bring in Adrian Clee to build on uh, your discussion of needing to have abolitionist as well as anti-colonial critiques of the liberal management of our planet for capitalist extraction. Um, Adrian, your work has long been rooted in a commitment to abolition and you've offered resources and leadership about how we might both envision liberation and practice it within movement work. With so many new organizations forming to, uh, to do mutual aid, so many new people being called into abolition work, an increased toward, turn towards city and county budget work and the defund campaigns and new funding sources for black and abolitionist organizing. What are you seeing shift and change in the struggles that you're a part of? This is a time of increased pressure on organizers and increased mobilization. Given all this, how are you thinking about our movements, um, how our movement should orient with regard to the role of government, local, state, and federal, um, in the light of um, Clee's remarks um, under uh, the current and, um, as Clee suggested, coming crises that we must avert? Hi, Chandan. Um, Thank you for those questions. And Klee, thank you for, as always, um, tons of brilliant sparks, tons of brilliant thoughts, um, and just really grounding um, grounding offers there. So what I, I have to offer into this conversation is that we've been in this, I think we're in like the best and worst of times as, as always. And I do think it's important to think all the time, long ways back, long ways forward, like we've come through so much we're all descendants of people who have survived times like this, times harder than this, times different than this. Um, and then right now we're in this place where movement is, many movements are inviting people to get back in touch with vision, even though we are exhausted, even though we are stretched. Um, we're telling people don't let go of imagining beyond this current condition. The reason we are exhausted and stressed is because um, someone else has been winning the imagination battle that we're in. Um, someone else imagined a world in which we could not equitably hold the resources and be in relationship with each other. And we know that doesn't work, but we can't let go of imagining our, ourselves beyond it. Um, so it's this incredible time where we can get our words in a lot of people's mouths. So a lot of people, people are saying defund the police, Black Lives Matter, abolition, climate crisis, Me Too, transformative justice. But I think one of the big next steps is how do we make sure that as the we is growing, it, that there's a shared understanding of the actual ideas and a shared engagement of the actual ideas. Um, this is one of the reasons like I write books as quickly as I can, as quickly as I'm learning things, even when that means learning in public sometimes, but I'm like, oh, let, we need to talk about this. Um, I think we're in an exciting moment with the, to me, I see this clear connection between defund the police and how it relies on the skills we build practicing mutual aid. So when we're talking about practicing mutual aid, we're saying we need to be in community care. We need to be in relationships that are larger than our individual needs, but include those needs. Um, we don't want an armed, militarized, punitive response uh, for anytime we need safety. And we don't want a scarcity-based competitive model uh, of an economy for need, meeting our needs for living. So how do we take care of each other's mental and physical wellness needs, mutual aid, right? Um, if we defund the police, that allows so much more to flow, right? Um, how do we make sure we're learning from the instances of harm that happen in our community and regenerating belonging instead of what our current systems do, which is dispose of, isolate and dispose, divide, c conquer, right? How do we actually say, no, we regenerate belonging to each other and to earth. Like we get, we, we, there's a relationship that's already there that we have to reclaim. Um, and then I think one of the biggest things we have to figure out inside of uh, this abolition work is we are saying to the world, we want to stop the punitive cycle. We want to stop the punitive cycle. And so then 
one of the things I keep looking at is inside of movement, if we want to be the invitation, the sanctuary, uh, the place that people can come to to be like, okay, I'm ready to move towards this new world, then how are we practicing abolition at the scale of our relationships? Not disposing of each other, not policing each other, um, creating a space where it's easy to make mistakes and, and learn from them rather than feeling like if you make a mistake, you risk being kicked out of movement or kicked out of the community that you're in. Um, I think we are exhausted and I, I can't overstate that enough that there's there's this quote online that I, I saw and I keep thinking of, which is we all need more than anyone has to give. Um, and so even when we're all trying to give our our maximum, then something else, you know, uh, I have several friends who, who are, you know, bringing me up to speak like what's happening in India. And I'm like, it's so massive. And I'm like, how can my exhausted heart take this on? And also how can my exhausted heart not take this on that we are connected? Um, and in Octavia Butler's parable of the sower, there's this whole period where they're walking beyond their exhaustion because they're in danger. There's nowhere to stop and they have to rapidly assess friend or foe, friend or foe. And I see that happening to us right now, right? Where we're so exhausted that our binary thinking is up. You know, we're like, are you good? Are you bad? Are you with me? Are you against me? And it simplifies us and hijinks ensue and we turn against each other and it makes us very fragile when we most need to be strong. So I think it is that time to reimagine everything like Grace Lee Boggs said, that includes how are we, how are our organizations, how are our movements. Um, I'll just share a couple more things. I work inside of a collective, the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute, and we're all about figuring out like how do we learn from nature to be adaptive and get in right relationship with change and hold many different ideas. This is always the thing that pulls us apart as we reach some place of change and it's like, wait, everyone has to have the same idea now, which never happens because we're a biodiverse species in a biodiverse world. So one of the things we're really interested in is how do we create spaces where people are good at holding a multitude of ideas and still being able to move together? And that means, you know, for me, mutual aid is like, oh, this is how we can practice that. You don't, you know, when someone's saying, here's a need I have, you're not like, well, what is your entire analysis? And if I don't agree with one point in it, then I will not be of service to you. Mutual aid is like, oh, I see your humanity. There's something I can offer towards that. There's something I need. And the mutuality of it really matters. That's what breaks the charity model, right? The mutuality of it flows. There's a question in there about, you know, how does govern, how does mutual aid interact with governance systems? And like, to me, the future governance we need is built on the foundations of mutual aid and the foundations of abolition, right? That we're actually saying, we're practicing how do we make decisions and recover from harm together so that we can create larger governance systems and interdependent governance systems um, that might start small. And I wanna encourage people, like there's so much happening globally, it can be very overwhelming and we get overwhelmed and then we don't take action or we get overwhelmed and we only take armchair critique action. <laughs> and I think that this is a moment where we need to not be ashamed to start smaller, to say who are the people who I can actually be in a mutual relationship of care and accountability with, um, and what do I need and what can I offer? Um, a tangible resource I wanna offer people is the ESII, the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute. We gathered, crowdsourced a, a list of people who are willing to mediate conflict within movement and it feels like one of the things we can do to, to help us hold each other, right? While we're under attack and under pressure and while we're trying to navigate capitalism, because I, I think philanthropy also, I think we'd be remiss not to mention the role that philanthropy plays in, in teaching us that capitalism is the only way to do movement. Even though we know we're anti-capitalist, <laughs> we know we want to do something else, but we still get stuck in that competitive, competitive model. So things escalate to drama, things escalate to division and escalate to, to needing some kind of intervention. And one of our offers is what would happen if we first turned to mediation? We first you know, got the book Fumbling Towards Repair by Shira Hassan and, and Miriam Kaba and did a community accountability processes. Um, part of what excites me is I deeply believe everyone has work to do in this. Everyone has a role to play in this and not all of it includes massive federal organizing, massive policy organizing, 
a lot of it includes humbling ourselves to the kind of relationships we need to get into and beginning to actually practice. And a question I ask myself all the time is, what is that world I am envisioning for me and my people and the children I love? And then who do I need to be in order to belong to that world and do that now? I do it now, I do it every day. So those are some of my starting thoughts. I could go on all day because I love this question and I love the, the book and the conversation and hopefully we get more. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, I wanted to bring Naomi into the conversation now, um, in part because as Klee mentioned, um, this is not um, the first viral catastrophe um, that we're living through. As well, um, I want, you know, as, Nate, as Adrian mentioned, um, we are in a period of acute crises. Um, and your work, Naomi, has such an immense impact in helping us understand how crisis and disaster roll out unevenly, how corporate and government responses worsen material inequality, and how um, Blockadia, for example, works against uh, toxic industries and people's recovery work to oppose disaster capitalism are essential um, in times like these. Um, the increased attention to mutual aid in the past year brings up questions then about government responses to crises both poor relief and disaster relief, and to what degree movements should aim to win government relief despite its predictable limits and pitfalls, or to build people's infrastructure outside of government services. Can you speak maybe to the tensions then that are emerging in our conversation in this debate, um, in that debate about how you approach these questions and what the last year's disaster and crises have added to thinking, um, to your thinking about these questions? Sure. Um, thank you, Chandam, for the wonderful uh, question. And it's just such a delight to be in conversation with some of my own heroes. Um, and Dean, thank you so much for inviting me and for writing such a such a wonderful book. Um, so I'm going to go back a little further um, in in because I have been writing about this and thinking about this for a long time. And um, I started using the term disaster capitalism um, in 2005. Um, it was it was actually it was before Katrina, um, and um, but it was after the Asian tsunami um, that had uh, killed and displaced huge numbers of people in Sri Lanka and India and Thailand. And in, in, in basically every, every place where the tsunami hit, there was a phenomenon of governments and developers conspiring together to seize land from small boat fishing people and small uh, hold farmers who had been internally displaced. But when they were returned to their homes and their farms, they found that because they had tenuous land holdings, um, they were they were evicted, locked out from from their land, um, and and were being held in these in, in, internal camps. Um, and then Katrina happened, and I started doing some work there. And 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 before the shock doctrine even came out, I was at a meeting which brought together. It was actually hosted by a Action Aid, which I think is one of one of one of one of the really good NGOs. NGOs get a, get a bad rap, but they had had brought, and often very rightfully so to say, um, but they had brought together folks from India and Thailand who had experienced this um, post-tsunami to New Orleans, post-Katrina, to talk about uh, the what we now understand as climate gentrification, right? Um, but you know, in fact, was was ethnic cleansing in in New Orleans after Katrina, um, the, the the bulldozing of, of of public housing that sustained minimal flood damage, but was on valuable um, uh, uh, land that was on high ground and therefore even more vulnerable after after Katrina, and the privatization of the school system, and and and. Um, and Saket Sony, who's a wonderful migrant rights organizer, who I'm sure is in the orbit of lots of people listening, and if he's not, he should be, um, was at this meeting. And this is where Saket and I became friends, because it was really funny, because I was using this term disaster capitalism, and Saket pounded his hand on the table, and he said, you know, enough. They have disaster capitalism. We need disaster collectivism. <laughs> um, and so I feel like that's what I hear in mutual aid is, is, in a, is, in, is you know our attempt at disaster collectivism in these in these times, um, but also 
understanding that that is not historically divorced from demands of the state, right? Um, that th there are ways of understanding the best parts of the New Deal, understanding caveat, caveat, all of the exclusions um, and, and built in racial and gender hier hierarchies of the original New Deal, but the extent to which, you know, it won social security and unemployment insurance and funding for the, the arts, the likes of which, you know, the US government has not done since, um, that was a kind of disaster collectivism that was using a crisis to diagnose the deep roots <clears throat> and extract um, some really important victories. But the flaws of the New Deal were not only the flaws that we're all very familiar with, um, I think they were also the, um, the ways in which it centralized power, the way in which it created um, um, sort of chari charity models and replicated relationships of de dependence. And you can't generalize about the New Deal because this wasn't true of every, every aspect of it, but it was true of many aspects of it. Um, so how do we learn from that <laughs> is to me a question because I don't believe we can afford to surrender the terrain of the state. I wanna be very clear about that. And I think we need to have a vision for the demands of the state that de that systematically de decentralize and empower local communities um, and make way for deep democracy. So um, I think we have to be a little bit humble about what we can and cannot do. You know, my, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to call Arundhati Roy an old dear friend of mine. And Arundhati sent out a, uh, an article at the beginning of this week and you know anybody who knows Arundhati knows she calls herself a hooligan. She is a born anarchist. She is rooted in social movements. She you know has not made very many demands of the state in her long, beautiful activist and intellectual career. Um, the headline of this piece was "We Need a Government," <laughs> um, and it was a demand of Modi to resign to make way for some kind of functioning government based on the understanding that the depth of the crises that capitalism is producing now are not on a scale that we can mutual aid our way out of, which is not to say that there isn't a huge role for much more empowered, better resourced communities um, to be able to engage in mutual aid, right? But I don't think that we're gonna be able to be producing our own vaccines. Um, we may be able to distribute them, um, but we do need to, to, to engage, let's just say, right? Another example I'll just throw out is something I, uh, I just published a piece this morning uh, on The Intercept, maybe we can link to, um, I, I think the headline is like a climate dystopia in, in Northern California. And, and it's about what, what, what has happened in Paradise and Chico, California, after Paradise burned to the ground in 2018, and about 20,000 people came to Chico as internally displaced climate refugees. Um, now, all of you who study and engage in mutual aid know that Chico was an incredible beacon of the best of what mutual aid can produce. Walmart, <laughs> the Chico Walmart was turned into a mutual aid festival, bazaar, campground, and I mean, the, 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 the cultural juxtapositions of this all happening in the parking lot of Walmart was, was just sort of fantastic. Um, and it brought out the best in people. And Chico organized to um, not just provide food and camping gear and love and helping people locate you know, friends and family members, but they also opened up their homes to, to to people who needed a, a, a you know a place to sleep, and the story of what has happened in Chico since is to me the story of why we need a Green New Deal <laughs> um, or a Black, Red, and Green New Deal, um, and not just any Green New Deal, a truly internationalist Green New Deal, and a, and a Green New Deal that designs for decentralization. Because what what happened in Chico is that even even with that amazing outpouring of mutual aid, folks weren't able to sustain it because they're in capitalism. And there has been wild rent increases and wild 
property speculation and just stress after stress after stress. The social infrastructure just wasn't there and people turned on each other. Now, people are still engaging in mutual aid in Chico, but now the mutual aid consists of showing up when the police go and evict people from their camps in parks to, to help people move to the next place where they're gonna be evicted from, right? Um, and so just as an example of what I think it means to design for decentralization uh, is, is a, 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 a new bill that's been introduced um, by Cori Bush, um, you know, somebody who comes from social movements. It's called being called Green New Deals for cities, but it's not just cities, it's, it's all subnational lo levels of government, territories, tribes. Um, and it's about getting direct granting to communities to design democratically design their own Green New Deals and fund it directly, not through market mechanisms. And it's really a challenge to the Biden approach. So I just think that's the kind of example of, of what it means to, to legislate for that kind of decentralization. Another one is the PRO Act, led helping workers to organize. Thanks so much, Naomi. That, I think that's a great start for <clears throat> the conversation to come. And I want to now invite in, um, Dean Spade, who is the context and the and, and whose book is the occasion for this incredible conversation that we've already begun to have with um, uh, Klee and Adrian and Naomi. And Dean, so one, we all just want to thank you again for your amazing book and for all the work that you're doing to support others doing mutual aid and not just um, that you are uh, writing the book uh, itself or having the book circulate. Um, Dean, just building exactly on Naomi's uh, most recent reflections, the most consist consistent critique then of your book on mutual aid has come from people who are concerned that it decenters government responses to crises or doesn't um, engage government responses to crises and disaster, letting governments off the hook um, and aligning in some ways unintentionally with right-wing efforts to, for example, defund social services or poor relief programs or, um, or, or not demand the government step in to um, uh, produce more vaccine. So how do you respond to this concern? Yeah, thanks, Chandan. This conversation is so fun and I, my mind is spinning with all the things people have been saying. Um, I mean, I think one thing I want to say is like the reason that, you know, around 2016, I started to try to write stuff and make videos that were more like popularizing the idea of mutual aid, which obviously I've been practicing in movements as everybody in movement does for a long time, um, is because I saw that when Trump was elected and people were really mobilizable, like a lot of new people who hadn't really been involved in movement work were pretty angry and scared for good reasons to have this person in office. And I saw that the, the there's this huge set of demobilizing narratives about how social change happens that were constantly unrolling. Like, oh, the ACLU will sue. So just give them money and that's how we'll get out of this. Or, oh, um, just wait to vote. There's this very intense um, kind of way in which we're all encouraged just to be passive participants and passive observers of politics. And of course, all the social movements that have ever won anything were full of tons and tons and tons and tons of ordinary people doing a bunch of stuff you haven't heard of because we're only told to look at the moment where the law was signed or the court case came down. And so I wanted to just lift up that. I feel like mutual aid is like um, invisibilized in the way that social change is talked about. Um, and so it's not as if it exists by itself outside of a broad social movement ecosystem in which people are doing lots and lots of tactics, but it's a really important tactic that um, helps people survive right now and is the on-ramp to participation for most people who enter movements. Um, and so I think what's complicated is like, we live in a society that has a big fantasy of the state as the caretaker. So we can get focused on just making demands on the state and hoping it'll turn out. Um, and in reality, the state is the crisis producer, right? Like these extreme extraction is what produces climate crisis, is what produces the crisis of a healthcare for profit system. It's what, like all the trouble we're in, all the poverty and stress and dispossession um, that people are in is caused by having a government designed to concentrate wealth. And it's doing a great job of that. And even during crises where we most need it to save us, it gets even better at concentrating wealth, which Naomi's work like makes crystal clear and is so incredibly useful for. Um, so, you know, for me, 
I, you know, I, I, well, I came into political work really looking at welfare and studying poor relief and crisis relief, disaster relief systems and working in them, you know, as a lawyer, trying to help people get their benefits. And it's just like, and, and also living on benefits when I was a kid, it's so clear, as Naomi said, that those poor relief and disaster relief systems are designed to exclude, they're, they're designed to produce white settler life. They, you know, from the New Deal to the CARES Act, it's like black people get the least, Latinx people get the least. Um, they're colonial projects designed to cultivate white life. And they expand a little bit when there's upheaval and then they revoke it and take it all back whenever they want, which has been, you know, my lifetime, right? The um, under Reagan and Clinton, et cetera, the, the shrinking of poor relief in the US and the privatizing of disaster relief that Naomi was talking about that we can see in Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Maria and the campfire. So, so those, you know, I don't have a lot of faith. I have, I don't have a lot of faith that we're ever going to get this white supremacist colonial capitalist state to like give stuff out in a way that's not racist, sexist, um, colonial ableist. Um, and so I think that's an interesting question for us because um, what, even when we're fighting for, let's say Medicare for all, right? Like Medicare has all kinds of problems for the people who can get it now. And, and you know, people in disability justice communities are sharing this, that's right. So it's very clear. Um, or, you know, many of us are involved in these fights to um, shrink the police budgets where we live, which is so important because they've only grown during our entire life, my entire lifetime. Um, and I believe in that work deeply, like as an abolitionist, like let's shrink and get rid of um, the police. And our argument is always, and give, you know, let's move that money to housing, childcare, healthcare. But I don't like believe that that's going to be given out in a fair way. I don't think the city of Seattle that I live in or King County are like good at that, right? Like, so I know even if there is some kind of poor relief or disaster relief system put together by the governments I live under, we'll all be doing mutual aid for all the people who are excluded, right? Undocumented people will be excluded or the affordable housing will actually only be for middle-class people and not poor people or drug users will be excluded. I mean, we just, we know. So I think this just is an interesting tension. Um, I think one thing that the conversation about mutual aid that's happening now in the context of COVID is useful for is it helps us distinguish those charity dynamics that tend to come with social services from um, what we see as mutual aid, which is everything for everyone, not cutting out stigmatized people, um, starting with those who are most vulnerable instead of those who are most palatable. You know, those principles are vital for thinking about, like as Adrian was saying, like what world we're building that's not just like a few band-aids on the world we're living in that, you know, keep the extraction machine going. I think also when people have criticized my my work and been like, why this focus on mutual aid? It's letting the government off the hook. Like we don't really have a choice. <laughs> like the disasters, I mean, the what the fire season is gonna look like this year, what the storms are gonna look like, what's happening with COVID, like we have to save each other's lives. It's not like we can be like, we don't wanna let them off the hook. So we'll just wait around and hope that something comes down. I mean, just that's not how our communities have been living um, and they're not going to. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Like, do we think that if we didn't, I mean, if we didn't have these governments, would we have a vaccine? I mean, I actually think that's an interesting question. I think that, that the current systems get in the way of people having healthcare. I don't think they help us get healthcare. And I believe that people would collaborate to do all the kinds of work that need to be done and better without the coercive systems we live under. I realize that requires the kind of imagining that Adrian is asking of us. So I'm not saying we're right there and I'm not saying we should abandon our engagement with governments. Obviously I've spent my life, you know, trying to stop a new jail from being built or trying to defund these police or whatever. Um, it's not about in like not engaging, but I think it's an interesting horizon of imagination question that actually also relates to our immediate strategy. So how can I work for Medicare for all while I don't imagine that Medicare for all will actually be for all under a white supremacist colonial government? Um, and how do we work? I think we already work coalitionally across different visions about this. And that that's part of why I wanted to have this conversation. I don't think we need to think the same on this, 
but it's really useful to have really juicy conversations about it. Like I can't imagine if I, if we're prison abolitionists, when you get rid of prisons, you're not going to have a U.S. It's like it's, in, it's it's essential to what the U.S. is, right? Or if we're border abolitionists, right? Like, so I I want to talk about a world that's not organized um, by the state form um, as an anti-colonial project, as an anti-racist project, as an anti-capitalist project, and I don't think that should be too scary for us to do because we can still be, um, of course, fighting the state we don't have a choice it's the extractive machine thank you so much Dean. i really appreciate that and i feel like it <clears throat> sorry i feel like it really sets us up for a round of conversations because I, I in a way there are some tensions between uh, i want to invite back in clee and adrian and naomi um as you said there are some tensions between the ways that you all are are approaching this um but also some points of convergence. Um, so it, it would be wrong to overplay the tensions as well. Um, so I, maybe we could just start by giving everyone an opportunity um, to maybe respond to each other um, uh, and, and, and we can go from there. Um, I know that we will have questions also from the audience, so we're gonna try to make some time for that. And I just wanna note uh, for the audience as well that we've been trying to put in um, links to articles um, and other resources that the uh, speakers have been mentioning in their, in their remarks in the chat. So please go to the chat to be able to pick those up as well. Um, but yeah, why don't we start with, um, you know, offering any of you an opportunity to respond to one another and to Dean. No, well, I can hop in. Um, I, I really actually love the weaving together of such different perspectives. <laughs> like it, to me, I'm like, this is where it starts to get interesting is um, that each person can actually hold their own. And when we have enough people holding their own, I think that's where we actually get a functional society. Um, when we don't, I think we end up with people being complicit in harm, harmful structures and harmful behaviors because they don't know how to just hold their own opinion <laughs> inside of tension. And, and um, one of the things I think, um, I don't know, something that landed for me a, a while ago was there's this consistent tension between building the new and how do we handle what's happening now? and the need for government, the need for governance, the need for large scale responses to large scale problems. And I feel like to me, um, it's only a tension if you hold them as if, as if everything is in the one moment. But if we start to see a longer lens where it's like, we are trying to build a capacity in ourselves to do something that we don't yet know how to do on a, on a larger scale. Um, we don't, we have smaller scale experiments of it, right? Uh, like what does it actually look like to be in mutual aid with each other? What does it look like to be in community with each other? But I think a lot of people is still theoretical and we're not in the practice realm yet. And we're still in the realm of like, oh, government tells us what they're gonna do. We resist that. We make demands against that, but we're not necessarily like, oh, I know how to create my own policy. And I, I wanna point to uh, the movement for black lives in this moment, because I feel like that's one of the places where I see people doing the growth across scale where it's like, okay, we were in the streets and we were there saying we want this. And then we're coming in and building these larger coalitions. We're building coalition spaces where it could be multiracial centered around black and indigenous needs. We're also building these other things and we're making policy fights. The Breathe Act is a policy demand, right? It's like, we actually need to shift policy and we need to write policy. That doesn't preclude that we also need a complete revolution <laughs> and that we don't think that this this system fundamentally will be able to serve us. So there's a way that we're like, how do we attend to those who are living now while we're building visions for those we, who are going to come after us? And I feel like whenever people say we have to drop one or the other, that's where we get into an unnecessary battle. Like it's like, there's some people who are deeply moved and skillful at figuring out what we can move right now. It's like, let them work, let them do that, let them figure that out. And there's other people who are very skilled at figuring out how do we imagine and practice. And I'm not interested in imagination without practice. You know, I'm not interested in just like dream, dream, dream forever. I'm like, I'm really interested in the people who are like visionary and then experimental. So there's literally so many places we need to experiment. We need to experiment with how do we actually redistribute funds and resources? And what does that look like? This past year has been for me, 
at a very personal level, a big practice of that where I was like, okay, I have some resources. I don't have a ton. There are people in my life who have none, no access to them at all inside of, inside of the pandemic. How do I redistribute? What do I actually need? And I've been in so many conversations this year with people like, do you even have a sense of what you actually need? Are you living above or below that? Like even just basic conversations like that, we're not skilled at that. And then we're, we're worried like our society doesn't function democratically. We don't share resources. Like, yeah, none of us are practicing. So for me, I think that that's one of the biggest places I wanna bring attention to. And then I'm really curious about where facilitation enters this. You know, that's my evangelism is I think we're often in tensions because we're not being held um, by people who can help help us be in conflict together well. And I think we need lots and lots and lots of facilitators to hold space to say, conflict is natural, it's human, it's how we generate, it's how we grow, it's how we deepen our analysis, it's how we actually you know, figure out what where we are aligned and can move and where we're not and we won't move together. Mm-hmm. And let's not waste time there, right? Let's actually mm-hmm. figure out like, okay, this is where we're aligned, let's move there. That's what makes great coalition work highly effective. So just a pitch for like, learn to facilitate, learn to mediate, like be that force in your community. Redistribute some of the time you spend online talking crap about people to learning how to hold people through crappy moments, right? I think that that would change a lot. Naomi or Klee, do you want to jump in as well um, and respond? Klee, I was thinking, for example, um, of your very pointed remarks about um, nations and societies that are doing anti-colonial struggle right now against um, the liberal state and how we might um, uh, imagine, uh, for example, continuing that work while thinking about Naomi's uh, remarks about building a red, black, and green New Deal. Um, yeah, let's let's embrace the conflict. Um, those points that you brought up, Naomi, were very poignant. Um, you know, stating that we cannot mutual aid out of this crisis, that we can't produce our own vaccines and the need for Green New Deals are interesting things that sort of hit close to home because I I believe we can produce our own vaccines because we have our own medicines as indigenous peoples. We, our cultural practices have been intervened into the level where that is almost impossible and impractical to do. But I think that's scale, it's scalable. And it's something that we need to rethink our approaches to how the overall social order and the, the medical industrial complexes are, are built as well. Um, you know, I think that this sort of like, you know, rethinking of mutual aid and sort of taking it from this notion that was proposed by Kropotkin and expanding it into, you know, for example, what Dean has done with the book are are, are critical. And I think that it ties directly into what Adrian is proposing with proliferating and expanding our concepts of mutual aid into mutual care and mutual defense as well in terms of abolition work. And I don't, if, if we can't do that, then, you know, to, the, the alternative is to mitigate this crisis. And, you know, we don't have the privilege uh, for those of us who are suffering on the front line uh, to consider those mitigation terms because we're negotiating, we're asked to negotiate away, negotiate away our very survival because I mean, our, it's not like our people aren't dying on mass scale in in the midst of compounded crises. Um, and, and so this d- directly ties to, especially with the Green New Deal and this obnoxious Red New Deal that the Red Nation is proposing to matters here close to home in the Navajo Nation, because we are a resource colony and we are, you know, an ec- the, the, a critical site of the epidemic COVID-19, the pandemic. And I I think the issue here is, is that, you know, and I've asked this question in some of my writing is, is that has the pandemic impacted our people so disproportionately simply because we lack plumbing and power lines? Um, Is it because there aren't massive corporations on every corner of, you know, our reservation? Um, You know, would we be that much more uh, immune to this disease if every member of our tribe just had a job? Because if we look at the dominant narratives, that's what, you know, the answers would be, the solutions would be. Um, And so we have, we can extend those questions to interrogate, would our survivability increase if we just simply had a green economy? Um, 
And I don't think so because the underlying power relationships are what have to radically change. Um, you know, so again, some of us are so close to the front lines that mitigating, you know, mitigating, mitigating our patients even is, is just produced by certain privileges that we have because, um, you know, we're, we're dying on mass scale and we're expected to salvage unsustainable ways of being, you know, all these new deals essentially are propositions to negotiate away our survival and, and settler society really is grappling with how to understand and respond to this crisis. But I think to, for that to fully occur, they have to come to terms with how, deeply on the deepest level, how their ways of understanding uh, this world and their experience in this world, their survival in this world has been built on a timeline that is a timeline that is linear. It, it has a sort of beginning, middle and end, and it is deeply embedded in slavery and genocide. And instead of fetishizing the, 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 uh, this ending um, with fantasies or even trying to recuperate this way of being, um, you know, I, I think this is the time of dirty hands. It's a time of direct action, meaningful, meaningful solidarity and critical interventions. Um, and our ceremonies are important sources, resources to establish that, you know, we have it's it's like the 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 sort of one of the critiques against abolitionist positions is that, um, you know, what are you going to do when the cops are gone? It's like, well, our people have lived for um, generations upon generations before colonialism, and we didn't have cops. <laughs> um, and and these ways of thinking are very new that are have been intervened in our ways of being, and we just have to record, reconnect, and re restore that. So, um, I, I, that's something I take issue with. Naomi, I think right. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Clee. I mean, I think it's a it's it's a it's a fundamental challenge. Um, I, I think the only the only thing that I would say in response is that I don't believe there is a Green New Deal. Um, I think I think it is a con highly contested terrain that is is very very much. Um, uh, still being shaped. I think there are absolutely people whose conception of a Green New Deal is how do we continue to live basically exactly how we're living and just flip the switch from fossil fuels to solar and wind and on an extractive model and uphold colonial and white supremacist uh, and patriarchal relationships. I do, I, I, I also think that there's just a way in which it's a term that is being used as the latest term to describe a very old demand, um, which is challenging the extractive mindset, worldview, a growth-based economic model, um, and is absolutely understands that that kind of flipping of the switch is not going to do any of the things that we need, including get our emissions down at anything like the speed that they need to go down. Um, I, you know, I see Green New Deal as a term that is a, a kind of a useful tool, um, precisely because we have some politicians like Cory Bush who are putting some, you know, the most kind of radical demands on the political agenda that I've seen in my lifetime. Is it enough? No, but I think it is it is very, very different than what Joe Biden is talking about when he's talking about his build back better infrastructure plan, which, you know, is absolutely just in the same way that the New Deal was about saving capitalism. That's what that is about. But I think when um, you see policies that are being designed that, you know, with the thing that I, you know, there's been very little discussion about what Cory Bush put forward and it's really worth looking at. Um, it specifically bans every false solution, funding for every false solution that you could name from nuclear to carbon capture and storage. It, it specifically prohibits funding from going to any form of policing. So it directly links the, the calls to defund the police with calls for um, 
funding for affordable housing, transitional housing, social housing of all kind. And it's all about empowering local communities at every level. So it's not perfect, but I don't think that there just is a Green New Deal that we can just dismiss out of hand. I think there are many, many different versions of it. People are fighting it out. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's worth lifting up uh, the, 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 the more utopian, uh, um, you know, elements of it out there. Um, and just, you know, bringing it back to Chico, I just, um, there's a phrase that I heard there from uh, a great geographer and activist um, <clears throat> uh, who, um, uh, whose name is Mark Stem and he teaches at Chico State. Um, and he talked about compassion stamina <laughs> um, or compassion endurance as a sort of puzzling out, understanding how you go from a community that breaks open its heart to its neighbors and just wants to help to a community that elects a right-wing city council. And the first thing they do is direct the cops to evict everybody camping in the public parks. Um, so how do you get from A to B? It's the same city. It's the same people, right? Um, and, you know, something that Adrian said around just how tired people are, um, I was really struck. There's an, there's an artist in paradise who made this beautiful sculpture of a phoenix from the flames of imagining how people were, were going to emerge out of this fire. And now she says, people are just soul tired, <laughs> um, you know, after fire, after fire and wave after wave of pandemic and all of the economic impacts of it. So I just think we have to speak to that. Like, what is going to keep people in this? How do we? How do we? How do we directly address that? And you know, what a lot of folks said to me is, it, it, we can't do it without the power of federal governments to, frankly, make money, create currency, create this fiction we call money. Um, and you know, in the in the immediate term, I, I'm not willing to give that up. I want to. Dean, can I say one quick thing, which is, you know, the, the piece around the exhaustion, I just want to hone in too that there's, we haven't really talked much about race inside of this dynamic, and it feels important here to name that um, for many of us, our whole lineage is tired, <laughs> our whole lineage is exhaustion and like a, a surviving apocalypse after apocalypse after apocalypse after apocalypse, right? And uh, surviving ends of the world. And I think what's happening right now is that there are more white people, more people who have experienced the benefit of white supremacy are also exhausted. And it, it's interesting to see the impact of that. The folks are like, oh, hold up, <laughs> you know, this this not being able to count on the government to protect you sucks, um, it, you know, and it changes how you view the potential of government, right? So I think that those who are still closer to having the government been able to serve them are like, oh, we can still turn there and we can still have an expectation there. And I think those who are like, we've been trying for 250 years, for 400 years, for so long to, to have this, to invest anything here and have something come back that actually met our needs. Um, and, you know, this is the heart of abolition to me is, you know, Miriam Kaba talks about this. Like we spent 250 years in this experiment and it hasn't stop the cycles of harm. So to me, I'm just like, the way we get more people to engage is, to me, I want us to uplift the people who are actually successful with experiments in mutual aid. Like to me, that's the that's the link, right? Is like, oh, like we're not uplifting pundits and, and people who are just politicians and who are, like get up and talk. I'm like, I can say a bunch of beautiful things, but until I actually get to practice being in community, like what I'm doing right now, it's surviving with others, and it going well that I have that in my system and that's where I lead from. Uh, I feel like that's so important that that's how we should be vetting our leaders is what mutual aid have you practiced? What community have you been in relationship with? If we talk to those people, can they share the kind of facilitative leader that you are? Do you mediate or do you go for the jugular? Like what do you do under pressure? What are, where are your people from? What is your analysis on capitalism? Because if you're going to go into the government and you are like soft with capitalism, it's, it's you're very easily going to get pulled into complicit behavior, no matter what you say. So I just want to problematize those things. And then, Dean, I want to hear, because I'm like, we're throwing all these things <laughs> What you have. Yeah, one thing that just comes up for me is thinking about this question of scale. I feel like this is where there's a lot of fear for people, like, is it mutually too small is the thing I hear about a lot. 
And it, made, it always makes me think of this thing in one of Naomi's books or articles that really was powerful for me, just the analysis of PG&E starting those fires in California and being too big to fail, basically. And immediately the government passes a law that makes it so they have no liability. Like this part where the government produces the crises, the problem with our colonial whether state or federal governments is the problem of scale. The whole way that our country works is that people who you have no access to holding accountable decide everything about your life. And mm -hmm. the whole project of the nation state is to like unroll something standardized across the land and force everybody's life to fit in it. And, and Naomi's work has helped me think a lot about well, what would it look like if people in a county got to say, you know, we don't want our energy from coal or we don't, you know, like that. I, that's a, I love that aspect where Naomi is telling those stories about people taking something back and it's always at this very local level because that's where we have the most influence. And so for me, I really like when I think about scale, it's it's how to decentralize because we still live in a context where people think that the, the ACLU and Planned Parenthood are the most important groups in, in the U.S. because they're the groups at the national scale. Whereas I think in Adrian's work really points to this, the most important work the most experimental and uh, the most generative is usually with the most local wisdom. And we especially see this in disaster that it's it's who knew who was on that block who, who didn't have a place to plug in their medical device now, who knew, you know, stuff FEMA could never know about us that makes or breaks our survival in that moment where the lights go out and the smoke is coming and all of that stuff, which we're just gonna be seeing so much more of, you know? And so I'm, so I, so to me, what scale really means is when we, share the wisdom we're learning from our experiments and we dis distribute that wisdom. So, oh, hey, we tried this scheduling tool. Hey, we used this facilitation method. We, you know, we, whatever it is, we, we figured out how to have ASL by doing this. Um, uh, that, that is the kind of scale we want, not the scale of centralization and standardization, just in terms of what I think we're trying to build day to day. Like we don't want all the mutual aid groups that emerged during COVID to all become one org that's got an executive director. Like that's, that would lose the wisdom. And I think this matters because what we're seeing, I, I really love this new article by Naomi because I mean, A, the fact that you ended on like, if Chico is, is in a space where they're just raiding the encampment every time, and this was the space where we saw all this compassion and generosity and where we've got this governor of the state who wants to be out there on climate change. Like, yikes. Like, in, if under these conditions, it's looking at like white people, right? I mean, yeah. that, that's another element where it's like, you know, this is a pretty homogenous, it's a multi-class environment, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the barest glimpse of the kind of climate apartheid that's playing out on the borders, right? Yeah. And I think that we're going to, I mean, I think Todd Miller's work is really useful for this, his book, Storming the Wall. Like we're just going to be seeing more response to climate, um, climate displacement with militarized and police responses from the state. So like it's on all of us to do something else. And I, I'm, I'm watching all these fights recently in LA and Echo Park and Seattle in December. I'm watching all these fights where people are getting between the police and unhoused people living in camps. And to me, that thing that Clee mentioned, like it's mutual aid, and mutual defense, like this is this the moment where it's time to be bold and to and take those risks. Obviously, many people have been doing that forever, but we need a lot more people to be um, trained in to how to do that well. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, I think you know, abolition is about discernment. So when Adrian's talking about like you know people messing with the state and trying to figure out how to make policy, it's also about like it's we're, we're getting rid of like anything would be an improvement or if they said our group's name it would be an improvement or if they mentioned the name of the person who the police killed it no it's like is this dismantling the police border the corporate control or not and we need to be like fierce with each other as we debate that like lovingly like i'm worried about that result like not having people who've been bought off into elite positions and are just like now we're going to present this and say it saves black people or it saves immigrants or whatever. I feel like that abolition is about, it's not just mess with the state, however, it's like, let's really think about how this stuff comes back to bite us. And that's, we usually know about those bites because we're practicing mutual aid. So we saw how that reform worked out in community. We saw what happened in the prison after they supposedly made that reform. Um, can, I, can I just quickly just say something about scale? I, I think maybe scale isn't the the best way of thinking about it like 
because I, I think that that it, we end up falling back on this idea that we need to replace one mega system with, with another. And I think we're all sort of agreeing that the that the scale in many ways is, is the problem, is, is core to the problem, the centralization and the remoteness between decision makers and people who have to deal with the impacts of those decisions. So I find like, um, and even replication is, is problematic because we don't want identical, right? So I don't know, Adrian, you probably have brilliant, um, you know, pollinations, <laughs> but, but I, I, I think there are ways to design for it. Um, and, you know, one example is the way Germany's um, e energy transition uh, legislation encouraged hundreds and hundreds of local energy cooperatives, democratically controlled microgrids, right? Um, so I think there's a way there's that's one of the ways that I think about, like, how do we how, how do we engage with a with a state um, w in a way that lifts up local communities and 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 gets us out of capitalist logics. Yeah, I do want to throw in there, like the for me, I keep thinking about mycelium, and mycelium to me is like my favorite nature metaphor right now. That I'm like, we need to be mycelium with each other because if the relationships are strong, then the relationships can generate the solution for that local place. So in some places, it's like, oh, what's needed is to compost this whole system, it's gotta go. And in other places, what's needed is to just communicate between the different parts of the system that there's something toxic here, but we can still intervene. And in other places, the mycelium is like, literally just generating more life. And we see that in our organizing communities where there are places where, you know, what Cleo was just saying, it's like we're on a front line where our folks are, are in dying in mass, right? And that's not the only front line, there's multiple of them around the world right now. So part of our energy, our mycelial energy has to be literally how do we flow resources there? And I know there's always questions like, what's the distinction between mutual aid and charity in, in conditions where we're talking about communities in crisis? And you know, I was having this debate somewhere online, <laughs> you know, as one is wont to do, about how I'm like, any place where people have been practicing yoga, they should be pouring back into India. It's it's I'm like there the mutual relationship is already there. It's just been extractive all this time. You can turn that around and flow back along those same lines of respect and care. And like, you've been receiving something. Um, but because of capitalism, we have this, this line that exists where it's like, oh, I purchased something with no sense of where that comes from. In the same way in movement, we, we do circles. We do circle organizing and circle communicating. And all of that links back to our indigenous communities and indigenous teachers. Like, we have received so much from those worldviews. We have received so much from those ways of being. Um, and then they're like, they're still here and they need us right now. And so sometimes it's like being able to step out of like the transactional concept of things and really moving into uh, mutuality. Like what does it mean to be in a larger scale of, of relationship or a larger mycelial network of relationship where the resources flow where they're needed. And I, I think then oh, we get many, many, many proliferations of experiments that can work at the size that's needed in that location. If I could add to, I think what's missing from this conversation though, and I think I need to sort of push um, back at is some of the logic behind the strategy is a logic that is still based in the sort of colonial legacies, especially in terms of utopia and the state. Um, you know, so many things have been done passionately throughout history, this ideal of utopia that have been the fuel for colonial brutalities and the legacies. Um, I think we have to examine um, our existence. We have to come to terms with that there are things that are not salvageable because literally they are poisoning our land, our water, our air, and our bodies. Um, and we can't negotiate that away. We're talking about a, a space here that the conversation has already been opened up and it hasn't been acknowledged. And this is, is there's a powerful movement that has been named Land Back, Indigenous Communities. And this moment is a moment of powerful intervention that is connecting with our ancestors' teachings, our ways of social organizing, 
and direct intervention for survival of this dominant social order and way of living that is completely unsustainable. We're constantly asked, and we're constantly used as indigenous people as tokens to, to um, find ways to mitigate and negotiate away um, uh, things that can help sustain unsustainable ways of being. For example, here on the Navajo Nation, we have elders still that don't speak English, that they've declared an autonomous zone since you know the 1960s, 70s, when resource extractive industries, and you have, we have to be clear, our tribal government was set up in 1923 by the US government specifically to negotiate away um, resource extractive agreements and um, resources under the land. But uh, in Big Mountain on Black Mesa, we have one of the most powerful forms of resistance of, of not just land back, but land holding, um, where our elders have waged powerful resistance against you know US law, congressional law, PL 93 531, passed in 1974, forcing you know, enacting the relo forced relocation of our people. More than 20,000 people have been forcibly re relocated, you know, in this sort of fictitious land dispute between Navajo and Hopi people. But the reality is, is underneath the land, it's the largest coal deposit in North America. Peabody Coal Company at one time operated two coal mines just 13 miles north of my family's place, um, which comprised the largest strip mine in the world, 90 square miles. Um, and all the energy, of course, was being extracted as a resource colony. It was being, um, you know, e exported to maintain settler colonies of uh, L.A., um, Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, and so forth. Um, and, you know, the the issue here is this, that every step of the way the, the state and the way it has attempted to negotiate has been resisted powerfully by our elders who still maintain their way of life. And their most powerful form of resistance has been to be who they are, to maintain our traditional ceremonies, grow our foods, um, shepherd our sheep, um, and sustain ourselves. And, you know, it's been looked at, oh yeah, you know, with the statistics as a form of, you know, poverty and so forth, but we don't see it that way. We, we have a different concept and understanding of wealth different concept of understanding of how to be in this world. And it exists to this day. Um, it's certainly a pocket in a microcosm and we're talking about scale, but I think this is a scale of, of spirit of heart that is connected to ancestry that is deeper than what we're talking about right now. We're talking about political arrangements with this logic that is still perpetuating colonial relationships. The underlying power relationships have to be interrogated and have to be, um, uh, composted. I think as Adrian said, I think that's a powerful way to look at this. So new things can grow and things can continue to be vital in the ways that they have been. Um, and that's our challenge. And I think if we look at land back, it is an assertion and it is, it's unfortunately mutual aid is a very co-optable term, but it can only be co-opted so much. You can't co-op land back. Land back only means one thing. And that contends all of the logics of what we're talking about with political solutions to address this, you know, our negotiations with the state. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in discussions where we're negotiating our survival because we've been asked to do that since day one here. Yeah, just one sentence on that is I keep trying to engage because people, I'm like the radical imagination vision person, but I keep telling people we have to be post-utopian right? It's like utopians only exist because dystopias exist. And there are people, they're like, oh, I live in a world where there's no trash. No, someone is still dealing with the waste. Um, but how do we instead, I want to point to the work of movement generation. I think they do a beautiful job of thinking holistically around these transitions of what is a just transition? What does it actually mean to be post-utopian and how we envision a future that um, is h h hard, right? What we have to face over the next several decades that's already in place just because of what we've done is hard. And we have to face that. And we're not going to be able to give people a, a flowery version of that. We've got hard work to do, but we can do it together. And inside that doing together, I think we can reclaim our spiritual tether to home, to this place. Um, I love that. So I just wanted to toss that in there. I really appreciate too what, what we were just saying, Clee, because it, it makes me think about that forced dependency, which I've heard you speak about before, like that, you know, a huge part of colonial processes to try to enforce indigenous people 
eating only from the settler food systems or having, um, you know, only access to survive through, you know, displacing people from their ways of surviving and forcing them to sustain. Um, and I, I'm just thinking about like all the food justice projects happening in so many spaces. And in particular, this is moving to me in Puerto Rico and Hawaii, places where almost all the food is coming from offshore because the traditional food systems have been destroyed. And then that's so disrupted during any, you know, of the many disasters that are being produced by global capitalism and colonialism. So it's like, I think that's just like such a deep question, like what it means to do mutual aid, both to defend ourselves from the, this, these things right now and to, and to be building something else. Cause like that thing's going to fall apart. Like that global food system that requires everything to be flown around and driven around. Like it's there, it's already breaking down all the time. We've, we saw it when hurricane Maria hit, um, hit Puerto Rico as Naomi's written so beautifully about. So I think I'm, um, just thinking a lot about that dependency. And that also makes me think about Adrian's work, which is so much about trying to change how we are with each other and our, our, what we have learned about our ways of being. And one thing I've learned, especially from trans community work and from um, Tourmaline, who some of you may know, is that isolation is the most dangerous thing for us often. Like the desire to, to crack our connection to others and to make it feel like, all you have is 911 or make it feel like, um, you know, people just, the, 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 the really dangerous situations we get into are usually because we're isolated. And so how do we like rebuild that fabric of connection for, for those who are isolated and, and for people living in subcultures of isolation and, and dominant cultures of isolation? Like, what is that really like? And part of that is the imagination to believe we actually could and can take care of ourselves collectively. It's not this individual neoliberal, like I must take care of myself, but instead that like we are capable. And I think there's like a fantasy about the state that's based in a fear that we are not capable. Even though we have the whole point of the government role is to make us incapable of caring for ourselves and one another, to make it so you can't give each other money without somehow being taxed on it. I mean, to all, you know, it's like to make everything to, to make people's, um, you know, holding of their animals and land a crime. Um, and I think that that's a, um, yeah, just a really challenging hurdle of the imagination and of, and of the lived practice as Adrian's talking about how, like, and I just also see people getting such deep satisfaction and transformation from coming into mutual aid. I'm talking to all these people who are trying this for the first time and in the last year. And I, I see people being like, oh, like this, yes, it's supporting the person in this encampment or it's support, but it's also just like, I feel so much safer in my life because I'm actually connected to others, including across a lot of differences. Um, and I think that's, that's the, like, that's just the very baby sprout of practices that we are missing. I wonder then if I could maybe ask a, a question as a round of questions for each of you as we get close to our, um, Ending time, sadly, and I want to also just say there are amazing questions coming in in the chat, and we are going to try to collect all these questions and also give them to the speakers to review afterwards if we don't get to all of them. Um, but this is a question that's kind of pulling together a lot of, um, of some of the different questions that we've been getting in the chat, um, which is to maybe to go back to Naomi's point that we're not really talking about a question of scale, um, but rather a question of um, uh, what are the mechanisms to build alternative forms of solidarity um, that are necessary to achieve um, the uh, modes of response needed to address uh, catastrophes and at which, in which they in the times in which they are happening as well as in the in the breadth of which they are happening um, uh, how do we for example use our collaborative knowledges to produce vaccines um, uh, through public systems which is how the vaccine was ultimately produced um, uh, it, uh, in alternative ways that that build in solidarities with uh, for example um, other uh, science regimes that Clee was talking about as well um, and so I wonder if maybe a round of questions for you all is moving from the immediate, how do you see us continuing this work of trying to imagine um, uh, ways of building a different world together that doesn't necessarily imagine the existing uh, mode of solidarity that is happening through statist um, systems or, uh, or a nation state system? Um, uh, uh, so maybe how you're thinking about uh, how we continue this work moving forward um, and not just as a response to a disaster.
I have a thought. Um, I think it's it's not the sexiest thought I ever had, but I do think that there's a need to be humble enough to be beginners at things. Um, that's the thing that I feel like this past year has really taught a lot of people um, who thought they had good community in place or thought they had good networks in place or thought they had good health care or thought their job was going to sustain them through something, or maybe thought they were essential. Um, and this year unveiled a lot about the value uh, that the state actually put on them or the value of what their work could, could, could cover. Um, and so I think there's this humility now of like, we are not where we need to be at at, in, in most of our movement spaces, we're not where we need to be to actually meet what's happening right now. And that means we have to humble ourselves to practicing some different things than we're practicing. And, you know, again, I really hold that I'm like, I see people and I see people, interesting new kinds of people getting involved in governance, running for office. And I'm like, you know, do what you want to do there and be willing to be held accountable. But I also want to see that same practice of accountability coming into movement spaces where we have to articulate our, the politic we're accountable to. You know, like one of the flaws, I think, for, for emergent strategy, you know, as I look back now, five years or whatever, is that I know I'm anti capitalist and I know I'm abolitionist and I know I'm post colonial. And I, you know, like there's certain things that I'm, I, or, or even I say post capitalist, right? Because I'm like, we can't erase it. It's there, but it, we want. I want to put it in the soil and have it be something that is like, we compost it. We know it's in the past. It's historical. It's a line, you know, on the Grand Canyon wall, right? Um, and then we keep moving. So, you know, I know those things, but it's so important to actually say those things. I think we need to have more conversations about alternative economic models that can actually attend to what we need to do. And we have to be humble again, because there can be such, uh, I'm socialist. I'm a I'm a communist, I'm a cooperative, you know, and it's just like, we actually don't have this figured out yet. We might need new language that is inclusive or, or that doesn't pull people back to something they can't open themselves to. I often have a whole conversation with people that is a socialist conversation <laughs> and we never use that terminology, but they're down with that economic model, right? And I'm like, okay, how do we start to have conversations? How do we humble ourselves and relinquish the labels that might feel so comfortable to us but that also divide us within movements right now so that we can actually find the solidarity that is available in this moment. And whether it's scale, whether it's mycelium, I do think we need to have that, that practice of saying, there are people who I'm in relationship with who can hold me accountable. There are people that I'm practicing being in good conflict with, um, at a, at, you know, that we can have these conversations and actually wrestle with the ideas rather than competing in a capitalist way to win the best idea. There's not a best idea for everyone. There's many ideas that need to proliferate concurrently um, for all of our people. So some thoughts. My answers or my response to that question is quick. Um, I, we need to constantly be asking ourselves that question and answering it every day that we're doing this organizing. And a lot of us is, have been, you know, considering that as far as, you know, um, mutual aid and, and this kind of work um, from before this crisis point. So I, I think like our strategies, our tactics always need to be oriented towards a longer term um, because I mean, mutual aid is about building relationships. And if we're not building relationships, then we're just providing charity. And so on the longer term, it goes beyond just resource distribution. I'm not sure. I, I, I just want to um, really uh, thank Clee for bringing land back into, into this conversation, because I, I do believe that, um, that, that, that if, that if that isn't, a core pillar of what we're talking about when we're talking about what what we want, <laughs> what is next, what we're moving towards, then it is ultimately replicating. Um, and and it I think that it it holds some kind of a key to how we dismantle um, uh, uh, state 
period, um, as we take what is absolutely essential in the short and medium term from those states. Um, and I would just encourage people to, to, to um, check out Harsha Walia's book, uh, Border and Rule. Um, Harsha and I were both um, mentored by the late, great Arthur Manuel, um, whose um, thinking really informs a lot of, you know, many, one of the many great thinkers um, and leaders whose work informs the land back movements. I'd encourage people to check out Unsettling Canada and the Reconciliation um, uh, Manifesto, which his friends and family wanted to call the Manual Manual, um, but the publishers wouldn't go for that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just uh, I I just do really want to thank you for that, and 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 just thank you, Dean, for um, bringing us all together. I learned so much, and as Adrian was talking, I'm always like taking notes, and I I just want to thank Adrian for um, all your podcasts that have kept me company during the pandemic and made me feel less lonely, um, and also um, echo what you said about facilitation because. Uh, Adrian's facilitation prowess changed my life when Adrian co-facilitated the meeting that led to the writing of the Leap Manifesto. Um, and, and it truly is just a tremendous gift and tool for, for, for our fu all of our future and present work. Um, Thank yeah. you. Such a pleasure. The tortoise does want to say hi real quickly. This is the <laughs> Um, who's growing very, very fast and has a lot of feelings about how we can slow down and know that we're always home. Home is with us all the time. Um, so, and we can poop anywhere and that poop will be of good use to the earth. That's what the turtle is teaching. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, this was a, a really rich conversation on pooping the Western states. So, um, and our, our emergent world to come. Um, that's already already here. Um, I just wanted to end on those wonderful remarks that that Naomi offered and, and remarks of gratitude. And reiterate all of our gratitude to Dean for writing this really important book and for using it to um, re-stimulate our movement in a conversation that has been ongoing and will continue um, to happen and needs to happen. Um, and with that, I will transition it to Philip. And um, we all thank you, Philip, for letting us be a part of Red May. Oh, Philip, you're muted. Uh, oh. <laughs> Am I? Am I non-muted now? Am I? Oh, good. Thank you all. And thank you all for this wonderful conversation, which should continue and in a way will continue in other parts of Red May. I just want to mention that we have a, uh, a uh, event called COVID, COVID Climate Chronic Emergency, Antinomies of the State, with uh, Andreas Mom, for example, who has uh, re resuscitated the idea of war communism uh, uh, to fight climate. So, uh, I mean, that's one certainly that needs uh, your voices in it. And if anybody was interested, you know, we'd figure out a way to uh, have you live in the Zoom room so you could ask questions at the end. Uh, uh, it's on uh, May 14th at 11 a.m. Uh, so once again, I want to th thank Naomi, Dean, Clay, Adrian, uh, the BC, or I, I can't get the the Barnard uh, Center who uh, who has helped uh, a provide the tech for the broadcast and the uh, ASL interpretation and uh, of course the inimitable Chandon Reddy for for moderating. Uh, uh, goodbye and in, enjoy the rest of the day. Oh, and also uh, check into uh, uh, what we talk about when we talk about Marx at three p.m. with uh, Paul Maddock and. Um, Jason Smith.